This podcast is an affiliate of BCW Supplies. The next time you need to restock on comic book bags, boards, boxes, and more, be sure to use promo code FSP to save 10% on your order. That's FSP for Flat Squirrel Productions. It helps support the show too. Many of you have already used this code and I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. 30 years ago, I stood in front of a comic shop advertising the death of Superman in its window display. That moment outside Heroes World set me on a path, a lifelong fan journey leading directly from that tattered red cape to this podcast. Now, together, we mine Superman's vast 85-year mythology by examining, discovering, and reconsidering the stories that have shaped the last son of Krypton. Welcome to Digging for Kryptonite, a Superman fan journey. I'm your host, Anthony Desiato. Joining me to discuss his epic action comics run, including the War World saga, is writer Philip Kennedy Johnson. Welcome to the show. Thanks, man. It's good to meet you. You too. I'm very honored to have you here. I've just spent the past couple of nights rereading your entire run. It was absolutely tremendous. I enjoyed it thoroughly. So first, Thanks, I want to say thank you for being here and congratulations on the run. Three years 40 some odd issues when we tally up all of the specials and annuals and future state material. And I guess I'm just curious now that the final issue has been out for a little while and the dust has started to settle. How are you feeling looking back on, on that tenure as a whole? Man, I just just couldn't be prouder of it. I mean, I I couldn't believe that I got the call in the first place, but man, I just didn't hesitate at all. Like I, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I knew, well, at least I knew, I knew what my Superman would be, like who he is. You know, I just, I hear his voice so clearly and I just could not wait to show that to people. You know, I, um, I, I can't believe they let me have such a, a long arc on war world. Um, and I, I gamed the system a little bit on that. Like they, um, they gave me some time. There was never like a number of issues. Like here's your, here's your limit, but <clears throat> you know, it's, Comics are all about the, the illusion of change, right? It's all just trying to get back to some kind of status quo by the end, even if it strays very far from that during the story. It needs to get back to some familiar elements at some point. It's this, it's this ongoing story that never ends. And if you completely abandon the things that make them what they are, that's you know that's not how it's done. So I, um, they they were starting to ask questions like how long we how long are they going to be out there? And but there were also a couple of editorial changes over the course of that story. Like the the guy that was a senior editor at that time left, and somebody else came in. So I I use those transitions to my advantage. It's like it's like May? No, no, no. It's August. <laughs> and then <laughs> and then there was an, there was another change. Like no August. I think it'd be really great if we could do November. Um. So it just kind of kept getting pushed a little bit further. But it that was not all my fault. Part of that was that um. I felt obligated to use the authority team that Grant had established in Superman of the Authority. And that's a big ass crew. And I wanted every one of those characters to have like a real, you know, point to that story. Like they need to be there for a reason. They need, they all need to have an arc up there. I didn't want any of them to be filler. So, I mean, six issues would never have been enough for a story like that with those characters all in play. You know, they all, they all had to have their moment on the camera um, we were telling a really large story that I wanted to be meaningful. Like I wasn't trying to sell like the best, you know, action comics issue 1040 ever. I was trying to sell, you know, Watchmen or the the Dark Phoenix saga or, you know, something like those those big touchstone stories that people come back to over and over and over again for generations. I wanted this to be a story that lasts. Um, and that was going to take time. So I'm just honored that they let me take that time. And um yeah, I just cannot be proud of the War World saga. I'm really um, happy with the Metallo story we told as well. Like that's a if uh, it was that was another mark I was eager to make. I thought that Metallo is a guy that we normally think of visually. He's just kind of a Terminator with a kryptonite heart. It's just like such a cool iconic visual. But who is he? Like, what does he want? What do you want? Why is he, is he just a dick for no reason? Like, what's his motivation? I wanted to know more about where he came from, why he is the way he is. Um, you know, it just really mattered to me that we take something of a one-dimensional character and make him somebody that the readers actually care about, whether it's positively or negatively. Um, anyway, yeah, I just, I I have such strong feelings for that whole run. And I'll also say I'm not done with Superman. I mean, Superman is my religion. It was even before this. 
And now that like if anyone that goes on my socials can you know find a picture of my son and I stand in there with our Superman shirts on, he's got his cape on and everything. That was taken before I got that gig. That was we're just we're a Superman household. I live on Kent Avenue. You know, <laughs> so I I'm not done writing Superman. Now that I'm now that I'm in the door, now that I'm in at DC and they know how strongly I feel about Superman, I'm gonna be pitching more stuff and there's gonna be more Superman stories coming someday. Awesome. Well, I look forward to it. I might circle back to that before we wrap up here, but uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear how proud you are of that run, rightfully so. And going back to the War World saga itself, saga, right? It earns that designation. It is this sprawling story comprised of multiple acts. If you'll indulge me a nerdy collector question, for sure. my reread, I picked up the relatively recently released softcover collection of the entire War World saga, those three primary arcs, the annuals, the the authority special, the future state material. And I'm just curious, in terms of the presentation itself, are you pleased with how it came out? And what, if any, input did you have with the collected editions department? I'm not sure how that works, if that was something that they consulted you on or, or if you reached out to them. They wanted to know what all I wanted to put in there. And if I have a regret, I wish I'd asked for a little more even. Because it's, I mean, I am... Um, I was kind of torn about how much to put in because it's already 700 plus pages. It's a lot. Um, you arguably could have also put in action 1029 and Superman 29. Um, that was, there's a, that two parter called the golden age that I did with Phil Hester. There is some stuff there that, that kicks off the events of the war world saga just a little bit. There's a thing where Superman gets, gets uh, radiation poisoned and you see Mongol and his crew just for a minute at the end. That would have been nice to include, but I felt like I was already asking for a lot. I mean, and I was, it's a, it's a, it's a big book. I also, I have like glossaries of, of, uh, words in various, um, war zone languages, like different war zone tribes, like their languages were different things. I've got a lot of that stuff saved up. We have some, some, um, uh, monster sketches and various other little, little bits and pieces of art that would have been nice to include. I have all kinds of notes about Warzone culture we could have put in the back if fans wanted it. Um, the, the thing that held me back was just how big that book is already. And um, I didn't want I didn't want them to push back on like, nope, this is too much or the price point is going to be too high or whatever. Um, so in the end, I, I erred on the side of caution to make sure we got the thing done. Um, but there is even more we could have put in there. We could have made it 800 pages easy. Um, so anyway, at, at a certain point, the book gets so thick, it starts to be daunting for, for them to print, but also for the reader to pick up. So I, um, uh, yeah, kept it, kept it modest, but there was, there's nothing in that book now that's not essential in my mind. Yes. I think it's a very, it's an impressive collection and it, it reads very well. And, uh, again, the tie in material falls where it, it feels like it should. Uh, we had a question from one of our patrons, Rick, who asked if there will be a hardcover uh, at some point, I was curious if you had any insight into that. I don't, I don't know, actually. There's a, that's a decision that's made above my pay grade for sure. I don't like it's all kind of like an algorithm about like how, where where the sales landed throughout the, the history of its run and what else might come out afterwards. There's just so much material. I don't know if they're going to do it or not. I think it, it might even it might depend on what I do after this. It might depends on it might depend on how sales how strong sales remain going forward on the paperback. Yeah, I don't know. I know the they're a little sparing on what they decide to give an omnibus treatment to. But um, I don't know. I love that. We'll see. No, I totally hear you. Well, from this fan's perspective, it's certainly deserving of the hardcover treatment if and when that happens. But in the meantime, this is a great, great collection. And for anyone who hasn't read it or is looking to reread it in a different format, I definitely recommend it. To me, it kind of harkens back to one of the first trade paperbacks I ever owned, which was that original Reign of the Superman trade, which not entirely dissimilar from this in terms of its heft, collected a ton of material and was all there in one package. And I worked at my local comic shop for many years. And so, you know, I've been in that position of kind of making recommendations to people. And I look at something like this and, you know, if I were in a comic shop now, I would so quickly hand this to someone, right? And they get the complete story. Yes, there's the material that came before and the dawn of DC year that came after, but in and of itself, you can give someone this. And even though hardcover would be beautiful, uh, the fact that this allows for maybe a little bit more accessibility in terms of price point, maybe that uh, you know eliminates a barrier to entry for some folks and they're a little more 
quick to pick it up, whatever it might be. Uh, I think that's, it's all good. Yeah. I mean, that's, there's a lot of story there for like, what is it? 60, I think. Like that's a, there's a lot of story in there for that. So I, I I do like how it turned out. I don't have any regrets about that. It turned out beautifully. Now, in terms of, again, I mentioned one of our patrons and and a fan of yours who had, who had that question about the hardcover. Uh, Speaking of audience members, uh, a listener of this show uh, is someone who I know, you know, because you named a character after him in recent issues of Action Comics. And of course, I am referring to Glenn Clark, known as Seeking Superman on Twitter. Uh, and for anyone who who uh, is drawing a blank at the moment, he's the ex-con turned construction worker who Superman has lunch with uh, in your run towards the end. And, you know, it's I've gotten the sense just kind of following you on social media and just talking to fellow fans, it seems like this run has been well regarded. I'm sure you've heard from a lot of people who enjoy your work, rightfully so. But Is there a more ardent and vocal supporter of your work than Glenn Clark? Because he seems to be, (laughs) seems to be number one. Glenn's pretty great. He's awfully supportive. Um, Glenn really seems to walk the walk, you know, like it's, um, some people just like comics and other people are like, especially when it comes to somebody like Superman, there are like true believers out there, you know, who really, you know, really care about that character, what he represents and actually, you know, moves the needle on how they live their lives. And Glenn strikes me as one of those guys. There is another guy, actually, too, who is it's problematic to name a character after me because his name is Philip, actually. <laughs> um, but he goes by RCDC or something like that, I think, on Twitter. Like, there's some combination of those letters. Let me look it up real quick. Um, RCDC, yeah. It's like he's this handle is uh, at Fallen Lantern 92. Um, but his first name is Philip. And he always comes and, and sees my, my booth at uh, Megacon when I go down there. But super great dude. Another one who, like, another true believer who loves Superman, who, you know, tries to, you know, tries to actually live a life that's inspired by the heroic stories they read. You know, that's the thing about uh, about comic book fandom, like superhero fandom, rather. I mean, comics are a medium, not a genre. But superhero stories, um, I mean, it's it's modern mythology, you know, like those characters, especially DC characters are the descendants of the, you know, the, the Greek pantheon or the the Norse gods. Um, Norse gods more, I guess, I don't know, those feel more like Marvel guys to me. <laughs> like they're how, I mean, they're all flawed. I mean, the, the, the Greek gods were, you know, pathological rapists and the Norse gods were also very flawed, like, play, you know, messing with each other all the time. And, you know, they're all, they all had, they all had their issues, <laughs> but as far as the um, like the thematic nature of the Greek pantheon, where like you know the the messenger god, the god of the god of the heavens, the god of the underworld, blah blah blah, those feel like the DC pantheon to me as far as their thematic nature and how how big they are, how much bigger they are than us. Whereas the Norse pantheon feels more like Marvel, where they're all kind of flawed and sometimes they they screw up and they kind of have to go back and fix stuff, and it just feels more. Like just people living their lives, kind of. And um, anyway, so superhero stories now just feel like the descendants of that to me. And um, if you're reading stories about superheroes, it can either be this kind of childish fantasy, or it can be your. It could be this um, this exploration of, you know, what it means to be human, who we should be trying to be, how do you be, how do you be the best of what humanity can be. Um, I don't know, like the, the fantasies of Superman and Batman to me growing up, especially and Spider-Man as well, were just the biggest of deals to me as a kid. I mean, just I, they, those are my first male role models. And the, the Superman fantasy of, you know, just discovering that, you know, you're you're this kid and you're a lonely kid in, 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 uh, in farmland and just not understanding who you are, what you're doing there, finding out that you were sent there by people who love you to do great things. And that you you have the power to go out there and just change the world, um, you know the the Batman fantasy that you know you can you can make you can turn yourself into a force of nature through just sheer willpower and and you know endless hard work and being prepared for anything and you know just these things you know really had an impact on me. They're not just kid stuff to me. Even now, they're not. I I really I teach my son morality tales through the stories of Superman. I really notice when people like Glenn show up or Philip and um, you can tell it's not just stories. There's this one, there's this one kid who came, I don't remember his name sadly, but there's, I think it was at awesome con in DC. 
And this uh, this dad showed up and brought his son with him um, as a big like like a treat, you know, like this, he was a teenager, like probably a high school kid. And the dad was getting a divorce, going through a divorce that seemed like it was probably pretty painful. And he he just took his son for a really fun day at this con. And um, he left the kid with me for a minute. To, to, he was going, he's going to go look at something else. But the kid had bought the future state uh, Superman worlds of war issues and was so moved by my take on Superman. He just, he talked my ass off about it. Like he just talked, he went on and on about, you know, how I get it. And he tell, and he was, and he went on to tell me how, you know, he gets it. And he was telling me all about what Superman means to him. And um, he, he was speaking to me, in, you know, passionately about this and, um, and like cried as he spoke about it, you know, like he, it just meant so much to him, especially now in this place in his life to have that inspiration just meant everything to him. And we, we hugged it out. It was like, it was a really powerful, like church, like moment, like was this, uh, this moment where like he was given, he was bearing his testimony to me about Superman in a way that I will never, ever forget. And that's, you know, Stories like that, that's why I will never take this job for granted. I will never um, forget how powerful these stories can be. I mean, while some people dismiss them as kid stuff, I know better. And I know there's other readers out there, too, that do, too. That's beautiful. No, this is tremendously meaningful to to so many of us, myself included. And it's wonderful to hear a story like that and and the the, the response that 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 young person had. Is Speaking of fathers and sons, I talk about this a lot on the show. I have a four-year-old son and it shifted my perspective in so many ways, as I'm sure you can, you can identify yeah, with. And Congratulations. Thank you. And especially over the course of doing this podcast, since he's been born, going back and rereading and rewatching so many of these Superman stories and things just hit me in a completely different way. And when I started getting into your run, it was a little bit underway at that point, not too far, but I started catching up and I started with the golden age and man, you had me, it might be one of the fastest instances of me buying into something because you had me from those first few pages, this discussion of fathers and sons and this idea of when kids are young, you know, they see their parents as, as immortal, as infallible, and eventually that fades away, but then that provides the opportunity for the, for the son to, or to step out, right, and become their own person. And just right from the jump, you, you had me. And, and any, any of those Clark John moments when Clark departs for War World, and he hugs John. He's like, I'll always come back, pal. Always. I, I, you know, I'm tearing up reading it. I'm just <laughs> tearing up as I'm recounting it here. Uh, but all of those moments were just, they resonated with me so much. And I suspect the answer is probably a lot. But how much of your your relationship with your son is is on the page when we read those scenes? Oh, man, all of it. It's, yeah, Anders, come here. Please. Hey, this is my friend Anthony. Hi. Hi. Yeah, this is Anders. He's my pride and joy, and we're best friends, huh? Yeah. Yeah, and when I got this gig writing Superman, man, uh, people sometimes talk about, man, writing Superman's got to be really hard, right? Because people say that. People say writing Superman's hard. It's not hard at all. When I, the fact that he's a, a, a father now in the stories, that made it like just too easy. Because I, I mean, I think about this dude all the time, and um, that story, The Golden Age, is just a love letter to him, straight up. Um, and the same thing with that other, my, my Superman arc in the, in the Superman title, um, I did like a four, four issue th or three issue thing, I guess, leading into Tom Taylor's run. And it was, it was meant to be kind of a passing of the torch, sort of like a thing where Superman, um, just recounts this adventure that they had together. Just him kind of get, you know, through a letter before he leaves for war world, he recounts the story about, um, when they had an adventure together and John saved the day, just to remind him that he's. He's got what it takes. And um, having the opportunity to tell a story, I, mean, I, I read that to this guy before bed, you know, and it's it's straight up a letter for me to him about how, you know, someday he's going to be more than me and someday he's going to be the Superman that I that I aspire to be. You know, that's who, he, that's who he's going to be someday. And um, yeah, it was just the best opportunity to get to do something like that. Ah, that's amazing. Sorry, keep, keep playing. <laughs> <laughs> Aw oh Yeah Comics celebrates and promotes everything that is wonderful about comics, toys, artwork, and the joy they bring to people. Visit them in person at one of their three locations, Harrison, New York, a.k.a. my local comic shop, Skokie, Illinois, or Muncie, Indiana. If you have kids and have been looking for a family-friendly store, look no further. Join Aw oh Yeah for exciting events, 
including creator signings, how-tos, and more. Visit awyeahcomics.com and follow Aw Yeah on social media for more. Their name says exactly how they feel about it. Say it with me now. Aw Yeah! We reference the television series Smallville a lot around here, and there's one Smallville rewatch podcast that's always at the top of my queue. Always Hold On to Smallville, hosted by our pal, Zach Moore. Zach and his guests bring tremendous insight, passion, and humor as they discuss each and every episode of the series that ushered in the renaissance of superhero TV. Listen to Always Hold On to Smallville wherever you get podcasts, and keep an eye out for the other shows under the Always Hold On to banner, including Arrow, DC's Legends of Tomorrow, Superman and Lois, and Star Wars. You've talked about how much Superman means to you, and again, that that's very evident. One of the questions that I always ask someone when they're on the show for the first time, it's called Digging for Kryptonite, a Superman fan journey. So I'm curious about your Superman fan journey. Where where did it start for you, and, and what are those core stories that really formed your understanding of who Superman is? You know, it's I, I don't ever remember my I don't remember my a life before Superman was like a huge deal to me. I I don't know what my first exposure would have been because I just he was just so omnipresent in my life. Um probably my earliest memory that I still remember now would be seeing Christopher Reeve in the film. Um I remember being in the theater for what I guess God man, would that would, have, would that have been the sequel? Do you know what year two came out? Oh God, they might take away my podcast if I don't have this top of mind. <laughs> was I think, it 80, no, 80, it, was, it was probably, it was probably three that I saw in the theater. Cause uh, the first one came out the year I was born in 78. Um, I, I watched that one on network TV. I know that. Um, but then probably two as well. I think I probably saw three was probably the first one I saw in the theater, but I do remember just, you know, watching the, at some point early on, I did see one number one in the theater though. And I just remember the, you know, seeing the the credits and hearing the and like the and the S shields over your head. I just remember being like electrified with the excitement, like, oh my God, I just want to be what that is, you know? That's that's still probably the most impactful memory is the image of the S shield coming onto the screen and that 3D thing with the trumpet sailing and Christopher Reeve just completely embodying that character. I mean, I understand that those movies are not perfect, but his depiction of Superman to me is perfect and will always be perfect. I cannot imagine a better Superman than that. And even in my comics, I'm trying that's that's what I'm chasing all the time. I'm trying to capture the sound of John Williams' score, trumpet parts sailing, Christopher Reeve, just with that egoless smile, just like I, you know, I, you know, I'm going to be, I, I'm your friend. Nothing's going to happen to you. Stepping in and being brave, not cruel, not, not, not even aggressive, but just like strong and kind. And I just, I'm chasing that constantly, trying to get that same chill that I'm getting right now. Like just, you know, we can be great and compassionate at the same time. We can be powerful but not corrupted um i'm trying to chase that feeling that i got that s shield over the you know over the head with the trumpet sailing i'm trying to chase that feeling all the time when i write superman um so that's that's where my journey begins really i mean i i i must surely have had superman comics by then because dad was always bringing home boxes of comics to him comics were just junk just to, to help me learn to read um he's like here i get stuff to stuff to practice reading on but I just completely fell in love with the medium of the, the marriage of art and language. Um, and Superman and Batman made up the bulk of my stuff, probably, even then. Um, so I don't remember what my first exposure would have been. I mean, I had like the, you know, Superman underoos and all that. Um, but yeah, but the, 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 the earliest memory that still sticks with me is that is that was one of those films. And then later, with uh, Superman 400 as well, was another relatively early. I would have been about six when Superman 400 came out. Um, that was a, an anthology issue, like the anniversary issue, number 400. And that, um, have you seen that book? I have uh, seen you. Uh, I've read interviews where you've talked about it, and I wanted to take a look at it before speaking with you. But frustratingly, <laughs> it was not Couldn't on the not on the app and not uh, collected 
Uh, oh, it's it, not on it, the app. It's really? not on the app. No. <laughs> well, that sucks. I'll I'll track it down at some point. I'll I'll give it a read. <laughs> um, well, I've uh, so it's uh, if you look at the credits on the front page, like Google the like find the cover and see if you can get a high enough def thing where you can see the names on that book. It's just stupid. I mean, some of those some of those names are just pinups or be like one page by a by a legend. Uh, just a just a pinup issue, but there are there are also some stories that are drawn by those guys. There's Steranko does a full chapter. Um, God, who else? Frank Miller does a chapter. I think they're all written by Elliot S. Magan, if I remember right. But um, anyway, highly recommend. I mean, they you know they're not all they're not all going to blow your mind, but the whole the theme that ties the whole thing together is Superman in the future, and it was just so unlike any comic I'd ever read that the, all the art styles were so not all the art styles. There's also some Kurt Swan in there. There's stuff that I recognize, but generally there were some stories in there that were very not house style of the time, you know, like Frank Miller, the Frank Miller one was very stylized as you would expect. And um, at the time to my eye as a kid, it was kind of ugly compared to the stuff I was used to. And some of the stories also did not make me feel like I was used to feeling at the end of a comic book, especially Superman. Some of them are much more complicated. Some of them, the good guy gets killed. Some of them, Superman's not even in it. Some of them are just more complicated. Um, but man, that was my first exposure to Superman as like high art, like fine art, where um, it's not just about the hero, you know, punching out the giant ape or the giant robot or whatever. Sometimes there are re- like meaningful stories being told in there that sometimes had more complicated messages. Um, so that was another pretty impactful um, turning point in my Superman lineage was Superman 400. Just the, just showing me where the bar really is. Even if I didn't get it at first, that's a book that I kept coming back to. Um, even now, I come back to it. That was, if anything, Future State is like a homage to that issue. Gotcha. I will definitely be sure to to hunt down a copy of it. Now, are you a triangle era guy at all? Because you use yeah. conduit in those, in those, some of those backup <laughs> stories and good. you have no idea how happy that made me. <laughs> oh, good, man. I'm glad. I, I mean, honestly, by that point, um, I hadn't, I had never been in a comic shop back then. Like I'd never seen one. I didn't know they existed. You know, this is, I lived in my growing up, I grew up in very rural places. Um, and I, the only comics I ever got were, well, I mean, boxes of, of ripped off secondhand, thirdhand books, but also sometimes off spinner racks at drugstores or grocery stores back when they were a little more common in that way. Um, so by that point, I was not reading as much, um, but I did, but I was intensely interested in the death of Superman and the return after that. And that's when I started, like, you know, being more of a pain in the ass about trying to find places that had comics and I was buying up Superman whenever I could. So I do my my exposure to the triangle air stuff was kind of that that return of like the reign of the Superman kind of time. And for a little while after that as well, when it was when long hair Superman was running around doing his thing after that, I was I picked up some of that stuff, too. So, yeah, it's I mean, um, there was sorry, I'm going to I'm going to take you with me through my house here as I find my charger before this thing dies in my hands. Um, uh, Let's see. <laughs> we were when we realized we were coming up on the anniversary of the death of Superman, the return and everything, um, I was already, I already had a a couple of those characters in play in my story. And we kind of figured out, you know, it wouldn't take much to actually bring everybody back for a kind of a reunion story during this Metallo thing. And um, yeah, we just kind of made it work. Like it was, um, in fact, there was a kind of a funny story where they, um, they put, the uh uh sorry what's the name the eradicator they put the eradicator on the cover without talking to me much <laughs> that's like we the, the thing had come up but i you know i was like eh, i don't really have a place for eradicator in the story but then it kind of went ahead without me and i was like well okay let's figure it out <laughs> and uh, so i just kind of figured out a way to bring him into it that, and it is, it is funny how often that kind of thing happens like somebody whether it be an editor or an or a writer or an artist some of you will kind of just go off and do their own thing for a minute. And then everyone else has to kind of just yes. And that idea and, and just, just embrace it and make it work. Cause it's a, it's a team effort, you know? Gotcha. So that's what happened there. 
Well, it was great to see those characters. And I know one of the things that you are, are so known for is your world building. And that's on full display, uh, particularly in the War World saga. And I, I do want to circle back to that. But, you know, when I look back now on your run, what stands out to me, and this ties back to what you, you were just saying a moment ago about how you see the character of Superman, what stands out to me the most is the characterization. He comes across throughout your run as so calm, compassionate, self-possessed and self-assured. And there are these moments along the way where he verbally articulates his philosophy on life and heroism. And those are the moments that, when I look back on the run, stand out to me the most. When he's locked up on War World and Midnighter comes to break him out and he refuses to go and Midnighter's like, why are these people's lives worth more than ours? And Clark says, they're not worth more, but they're not worth less. And even going back to the Metallo arc, which I very much enjoyed as well, and it was great to see that character come back and get a fresh spin and, and all of that. But when he offers to help Metallo's sister after everything that Metallo has done, and Clark is like, well, I, you know, anyone, anyone would help. And he's like, well, I wouldn't. He goes, well, not yet, but maybe someday. The potential that he sees. And the the third that, that comes to mind as well, when um, also in that Metallo arc, when they're fighting the the drones in the streets of Metropolis and Clark directs uh, Keenan to, to save one of them because the heart's still beating. And this idea of if he dies now, this is all he'll ever be, right? Clark sees the potential for what he could be. Uh, those moments resonated so much and I feel like really encapsulated the character and certainly your view of the character. I guess the, the question I had is, when you're when you're constructing those issues, it's like, do you have those moments that you know you want to drop in and you're kind of building around them? Or is it just the stories unfolding and then there's a moment where you have an opportunity to sprinkle them in? Um, it's it's a combination of both. Sometimes like both have happened. Um <clears throat> anytime Superman speaks, I try not to let it be just a throwaway thing. Um, like people ask me who I, who I read for my voice for Superman. Like, who do you, who do you read for inspiration for Superman's voice? And aside from some key moments, I typically don't read a lot of Superman comics for his voice. I, t I will read, um, like socially conscious Pulitzer prize winning journalism. Like I'll, I'll look up who won the Pulitzer for whatever. I'll kind of go through lists of stuff that won or were considered for various awards in journalism. And I find things that are on topics that Clark Kent, not Lois Lane or anyone else, that Clark Kent would choose to write about, like human interest things that show what we're capable of. And I read those things. And I read uh, speeches by great leaders, um, people who inspire us, MLK, FDR, um, you know, Kennedy sometimes. There's, there's different ones. There's certain great speeches that I try to just keep in the back of my mind and um, capture Superman's voice that way. People who just kind of remind us what we're capable of. Um, and I mean, in hopes that they will help me capture those moments or rather capture my impression of those moments from those Superman films where, um, you know, Superman, um, you know, saving the people from the, you know, in the helicopter and like, or the the plane, whichever one. See, when he's like, I uh, certainly hope this hasn't put you off flying. <laughs> you know, it's still, you know, statistically speaking, it's still the safest way to travel. Kind of gives a little, a little PSA. It's, it's not about him. It's about them. And he's just there to help. And, um, or the moment, the, the, who's got you, you got me, who's got you moment in that first movie. And he, he just gives this like selfless, this pure smile or the, um, the, you know, general, would you like to step outside kind of a thing where it's almost corny? Like I can't let you do this kind of moments. Um, man, those moments are so great. And I, I'm trying to capture the feeling that I had watching those. Um, and yeah, I, I want to see, I want to see him doing something really impressive. Um, but then show, show just, just these moments of intense kindness and compassion, like right then, you know, um, just take take the moment where, you know, he he stops the tank and pick up picks up the car off and puts put back on the bridge and then you know opens up the back seat and checks on the little kid's seatbelt and all that, and makes them feel like heroes for wearing their seatbelt. Like it's you know, do you want to do something for me? Make sure you wear your seatbelt just like you did today. 
a seatbelt did more to save you than anything I did. Just making them feel like the hero. You know, those those moments are what make him feel like Superman. That's what sets him apart from Iron Man, you know, or or any other hero. So those those moments are just absolutely crucial in the book. If they're not there, it's not a Superman story. I want to see moments like that where he he balances great visual feats with ultimate compassion and and also um, moments where I can remind the reader that the only reason the powers are there should be to remind us how incorruptible he is and how selfless he is. Like the thing where he, um, you know, Metallo is as, is as amped up as he's going to get. He's completely overpowered for where he's been. And um, he's about to kill the kids, the super twins and Superman exp- shows us how, how dope he actually is post war world. And he creates this gigantic construct out of his own, um, biokinetic aura. The thing that helps him move stuff around, he expands it beyond his body, makes like a Superman mech, basically, and obliterates him, just completely stomps him. But rather than knock him unconscious or pull him apart, he helps him put him, he pups, uh, helps put him back together. And it's like, okay, now that you're not going to kill my children, let's go save your sister together. You know, like it's, if he just, if we just saw Superman stomp a guy, the Hulk can do that too. But Superman's not going to be like, okay, now that I've saved my own kids from you, I'm going to help you because because you do the same for me. You know, like that that Superman thing, even though that's clearly not true, he still has that optimism in his character someday. Fat Moose Comics is New Jersey's best and oldest comic book store. Established in 1982 and under new ownership since 2020, Moose sells a wide selection of comics from every publisher and time period along with action figures, graphic novels, posters, statues, and more. If you're looking for something and they don't have it, they can probably get it for you. They know a guy. Visit Fat Moose and Whippany the next time you're in the Garden State, and be sure to reach out via the Fat Moose Comics Facebook page. This episode made possible in part by educator, hobby comic book collector, and pop culture enthusiast Sam Lim. Sam is based in the South Jersey area and is looking to connect with other comics fans as well as retailers. They're also looking for comic shops to explore, so recommendations are welcome. Be sure to follow Sam on Instagram at SZL Comics to see their latest comic pickups and shop adventures. Kind of circling back to the world building of, of all of this. Uh, I'll say this too, as far as War World Saga itself, whenever I've talked about it on the show, the word I keep coming back to um, is spiritual, not, not in a religious sense per se, but spiritual in that you know, Clark and his team show up on War World to to liberate the slaves, including the descendants of this lost Kryptonian sect that you that you introduced here. Uh, and you know, they and the, the audience initially probably expecting your typical uh, supervillain, uh, you know, throwdown, and it ends up not being that. Right, Mongol and his cronies quickly get the jump on Clark and the team, and as they're taking apart Clark's team, the people are chanting for Mongol, and it quickly becomes clear that this is a fight for the soul of the people of this planet. And over the course of, of your run there, you introduce so much about the origin, history, and culture of War World. And I suppose the question that I had is, did you kind of always have an itch to scratch with War World where you saw greater potential and you wanted to do something with that setting in particular? Or was it more you had these ideas and then War World kind of emerged as the vehicle to explore them through? I had given a fair bit of thought to War World, like how I wanted, I always wanted to see more from, there are certain settings in the DC universe that I always want to see more of. Um, War World being one of the big ones, Atlantis being another, um, Mars being another one, like this, like the, the, I wanted to know more about where, where John Johns comes from and what that culture was like and how it, you know, how it shapes who he is. Um, you know, Themyscira is has been relatively well served, but uh, I'd, I'd I'd always take more. Um, yeah, there's there are these settings that I just I want to see fleshed out more, and especially War World probably because I mean if you just if you just start asking questions and answer every the key to world building for me is to answer every question with another question and just keep going down the rabbit hole until it feels real. You know, like if you um, if you drive through any town. You see a sign, and sometimes it'll be somebody's name. Okay, why is it called that? So, so imagine you knew the answer. Like, okay, this is this is the name of the the mayor during this time. It's the name of uh, the the contractor's 
wife at the time or whatever, like if you, if you find out who that person is, okay, well, why, why did this person, why did this guy name this thing after his eldest daughter or whatever? And just keep asking more questions and it becomes a real story. It's not just a stupid word on a sign. And whenever I see, especially high fantasy and sci-fi, when it's surface level stuff, you can totally tell. Um, when it's just West Street and there's no there's no story behind that, um, it just makes you not care. But if it's if instead, if you can tell that there's depth there, if it's a name for a reason, you can feel that there's more there than you're seeing. And once you don't, it, it makes you want to know more. Um, God, what's an example of that? Um, well, okay, so we got a planet that we know, we know we've established that it's this planet um, that is just there to like to make war. It's just like this 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 war based planet that just travels and conquers. Okay, so who's there? We know the war zoons are there, the people who primarily live there. We know that post the Bendis run, we know that Mongol himself is a war zoon. He's considered like the big big biggest baddest war zoon, and that every Mongol is the son of another Mongol. And that's how it goes. Um, we know, um, I mean, well, okay. So we have to assume that if they're conquering everyone, they're also taking slaves almost certainly. And that would mean that there's got to be slaves from all kinds of different planets of all different species. And okay, well, what does that look like? So we got a very, a very Creole-esque culture where there's like gigantic planetary melting pot of cultures um, it looks like a metal planet usually. How does that work? Is there an atmosphere? Because I mean, they're breathing something. They're just walking around on the surface. So there's got to be an atmosphere, presumably. So that means there are clouds, probably. Like there's got to be some kind of, there's like some kind of a, wait, I don't see a bubble around it. So how does that work? So there's some, there's, there's moisture, there's precipitation, presumably, and it's metal. So what if there are these gigantic lakes of, of essentially rust water. And that's why the planet is red usually, like it's, it's oxidation. So, you know, you just keep going further and further and further and it starts to look like a real place. And these, the war zoons are the most warlike culture in, you know, the universe basically. So wouldn't they be at war with each other too? Like they, I, I mean, are we supposed to believe that they all get along up there while we can't on earth here? You know, so surely there are tribes at war with each other all the time, which means they have different cultures. And then I started to lay the seeds for these different war zone cultures that we see a little bits and pieces of throughout the throughout the story. So that's the key to world building is just just not being satisfied with one answer. Like one answer should lead to ten more, and those to ten more, until it feels real. Oh, it's so cool to get that insight into the process. It's it's funny because I always. I guess I always looked at War World as kind of the meat and potatoes version of Apocalypse and Dark Side. Where on 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 Apocalypse, there's all this business about Dark Side feeding on the despair of the people, and there again there seemed to be more of that kind of uh, spiritual side to it in in, in a sense. Uh, whereas War World, again, more more mechanical, a little bit more what you see is what you get, and so this really put a lot of meat on the bone uh, and 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 fleshed out a lot, and I feel like elevated the setting and the, and the character or the title even of Mongol. I feel like it was really important because of the obvious similarities between dark side, Mongol, Thanos, all those big muscly multicolor villains from space, <laughs> you know, like they're all, you know, to the, to the, the, the passing reader who doesn't really follow this stuff. They're all kind of the same. Um, they're all just kind of want to make war and conquer everything just because um, I wanted to show how they're different. Now to me, dark side is not, a character that you can just punch in the face. He's an actual force of nature, he, like a literal, like a, an actual, like a thematic God kind of force where um, he is like the, he is the concept of decay, the concept of shadow in life, you know, like just there's some, it's, it's not something you can just like get into a cage and fight. Whereas Mongol is that he's super badass, but he's also at his core, he's still a man. I want, although I did want to explain where his where the chess piece comes from and all that, so that was important because um, it's never really explained what that thing is and why it's like I don't know. I just wanted to know, so it was fun to actually have some little fourth world tie-ins. But um, 
Anyway, yeah, I, I really wanted to – differentiating between War, uh, Mongol and the other big muscly guys was also very important to me. And now I feel like it's just giving it that – giving War World that cult of slavery, that kind of cult of personality built around Mongol and uh, showing this all – this big con and that the you – know, showing more of what the War Zunes are. I don't think anyone's going to – anyone who reads those books now has a clear understanding of how he's not dark side, you know? Yes. No, absolutely. You mentioned uh, Bendis uh, a couple minutes ago, and of course you followed his tenure on on the titles. Did you ever have any conversations with him or any other prior yeah. Superman writers when you when you came on? I did, yeah. Brian was great to me. He was he was super kind and helpful about, about the whole experience, and we talked about where his run left off and where I would like to pick up. And it's, I mean, when when they handed off, when, the, when Mongol killed, when Mongol who is about to be killed Mongol who is back then um, and became Mongol who is, that was a big favor to me because I mean, we've already kind of established who Mongol, who the old Mongol was. And now we can, it gave us an opportunity to show a Mongol that was a little more complicated and a little cleverer and not just about strength. You know, somebody who actually had it out for Superman and could take him down at least for a bit. Um, so that was cool. I thought it, it just, Mongol and Warworld seemed like the obvious choice based on the context from which I was taking the book. Gotcha. Um, that was just, yeah, the obvious choice for a lot of reasons, but also I just felt like they felt like Brian had kind of set the stage for that kind of a story. And also because he had humanized Superman so much in his story, made it all about the daily planet and um, Superman's shortcomings and the, you know, his inner workings of his mind and about how he interacts with his, his peers at, at work and uh, so much stuff about Jimmy and Lois and all them. It just felt like the right time to really, really play up the super in Superman and make tell this big epic Spartacus in space kind of story. Acme Comics is a locally owned and operated comic book store in Greensboro, North Carolina for people of all ages and walks of life. With more than 40 years and a new second location to its name, Acme is a multiple time Eisner Award nominee. The shop features a significant contemporary and vintage selection as the Acme team uses their collective knowledge and resources to connect you with the best material. Mail order subscriptions to new releases are available, and all offerings are available anywhere via mail order. Follow Acme on social media and eBay, listen to the Acme cast on all podcast services, and visit acmecomics.com for much more. Filmmakers and movie fans alike should be sure to attend these film festivals. Brightside Tavern in Jersey City, Hang On to Your Shorts in Asbury Park, Point Lookout on Long Island, and Round Reel in Bloomfield, New Jersey. Take it from an alum of two of them. Submission information for filmmakers, as well as details about the festivals, can be found at filmfreeway.com. Follow the festivals on social media for news about events, discounts, tickets, and more. Also, listen to the Hang On To Your Shorts and Cullen On Film podcasts available via a shared universe network. You know, speaking of Clark uh, at, at the Daily Planet, one of the things I loved in your final arc, New Worlds, was the scene where Clark, Clark, uh, not not Superman, is the one who's interviewing uh, Nora Stone, the leader of the Blue, uh, the Blue Earth movement. Um, obviously, for so much of your run, Clark was was off world. I'm just curious, were there certain dynamics or settings or, or characters you wanted to do more with that you just didn't have the opportunity to with with your tenure ending? Um, huh. what do I say here, well, as I say, I have more I want to do and I, I shouldn't tell, I shouldn't talk about everything I want to do. Cause it's, I think it's probably going to happen sooner than later. So, but, um, something, okay. I'm trying to think of something that I want to do more with that I haven't done yet. I want to do a Terra man thing, man. Um, I think, I mean, I haven't read the issue yet, but I got the, I got the clear impression that, that Josh is going to do that in his Western issue. Um, but I, I'm not ready yet, so I can't speak to that. But I, uh, I, I wanted to real bad. I think, I think Terra Man is another character that could have been fleshed out and made really cool. Terra Man is not always cool, but he feel like he could be. Um, let's see what else. There's a lot of kind of like classic villains like that that um, that kind of don't fit in my vision for what Superman is. I, I like taking the Christopher Reeve Superman, but putting him in much bigger stakes, darker scenarios than we actually saw in those movies. Um, you know, I, those movies, again, it's all about Christopher Reeve's depiction for me, le less so than the actual plot. Um, so like, you know, Lex Luthor and his, and his dumpy buddy come on screen and the little, the tuba theme comes in. Boop, boop, boop. 
It's, it's just this inherently derpy kind of approach to to supervillain. And I want to see him fight guys who are legit scary. Um, not, you know, 80s camp. So um <clears throat> there are characters like Toy Man that if if I had done Toy Man, it would have been a very different kind of take. Uh, one that I'm not sure would have been honoring the fans. Like if they want to see Toy Man come down the street in a big, like, you know, you know, marionette soldier kind of a toy or something. It's just not kind of, it's not really where I'm at. I want to see him. I'm trying to tell stories that really matter to me deeply about, you know, the war world saga is about human trafficking. The, the stories that came after that on earth were about refugees and blue earth is very clearly about, you know, political divisions happening now around the world. Um, those are stories that matter. I feel like if you're not telling stories that matter about the Superman story, you're, you've kind of missed the point. I want to see how Superman would deal with these impossible issues. Um, so stuff like Missile Plick um, just didn't really have a place in my run. But yeah, somebody else I would have liked to have done something with. I do have strong feelings on Dark Side. I feel like Dark Side's kind of been done to death, and I it's not it's not the right time for a Dark Side thing from me. For, I mean. With other dark side things happening recently and upcoming, um, I um, yeah, it, it didn't feel like it was my place for a dark side story right now, but I would have loved to. I do have strong feelings on dark side. Again, I don't think he's a guy you just punch in the face. I think it's it's like you're fighting the concept of you know something just like fighting actual death or fighting the concept of war. You can't just go out there and just punch your way out of that. So. Um, I would love to do a Superman dark side story. Like Superman meets the fourth world kind of a thing would be really cool. Um, and there are other things I'd love to do, but um, I think I'm going to be doing them. So I'm going to, I'm not going to mention them. To fair enough. And I, I look forward to hopefully seeing all of that come to fruition. You know, that's one of the things when uh, word came out that your run was going to be ending. I like, I think many people who've been following the title, you know, we were disappointed I think I kind of have my answer from the way you've been talking about this, but was, was it your decision to leave the title or was this just sort of time for changing of the guard uh, from DC's perspective? Um, I don't want to talk too much about that. It's um, I will say that the DC universe is a, is a shared one and we all, we all share the toys and I mean, we are all, all the, the talent involved in the books, the writers, the artists, the editors too, like everyone involved. They're all resources that we use to tell these stories. And I'm one of those resources too. And every few years they move all that stuff around, you know, to make, you know, make sure the love gets spread make sure that all the, all the titles remain evergreen and they're all getting, you know, this, the talent gets moved around. That's just how it goes. Um, I would have happily written action comics the rest of my life, like for free. I mean, I've got a lot of Superman stories to tell and I'm going to keep telling them hopefully. Um, but I do have other stories I want to tell too, and they want me to. So yeah, All right. we'll, we'll see what happens next. I don't want to spoil anything. Fair enough. Well, speaking of, of sharing, one of the issues I wanted to ask you about was Action 1050, which I know was a collaboration among you, Josh Williamson and Tom Taylor. And yeah. one, of, one of the things that come, or the main thing that comes about uh, in, in that issue is the restoration of Clark's secret identity, but, um, and at the hands of Lex Luthor, who is one of the few remaining people who knows the secret. Now, my audience has heard me talk about this probably every few episodes for the past few years. I'm always go, I've always been going on about how I see this, this vision of a dynamic between Clark and Lex where, where Lex knows the secret and it works and it's interesting. And I could not have been happier when I saw that come to pass. I was like, I've been saying this for years. I'm just curious, what was the process like, those conversations? And was there any kind of pushback either within, you know, among the three of you or, or from DC, like just anything that you can share about how that came to be. Cause I've been chomping at the bit for that forever. And I was so happy because I think it's fascinating. The decision to put the genie back in the bottle was one where the editors were enthusiastically looking to do it. Josh was enthusiastically looking to do it. Tom was enthusiastic about it. I was the only one who was like, I think we should just talk for a second. <laughs> like, let's talk about what we're gaining and what we're losing. Because, I mean, the thing's been done, you know, that it happened. And we have not yet really, he's, you know, Clark's been on Warworld almost since then. 
we haven't really like that. That was an opportunity to change the relationship between Superman and everybody else. And it's like all his villains, like every, it would change every relationship he's ever had. And we're not really touching any of that now. If we just, comp- if we just turn it around right now, we, we do lose that. We also, I do love the fact that Superman, the, the bastion of truth and justice is finally telling the truth about this giant thing. who has been lying to everyone forever. Um, that I feel like is true to his character. Um, you know, but I mean, it's true that we don't have, we, we don't really have a meaningful like Lois and Clark kind of relationship when it's actually Lois and Superman. It completely changes that whole dynamic. And that is a fun one. It's, you know, you also lose just the powerful moment of Clark Kent, just the regular guy seeing him, seeing the, the, the every man, you know, run to the roof and like open his shirt and become Superman. Like that's a powerful part of who Superman is. And we have lost that. So we'd be getting that back. We'd be getting Lois and Clark back, but we do lose stuff too. If we do this, so let's just be sure. Everyone else was like, we don't need to talk about anything. Let's just do this. Um, and I totally get that. I, Cause it, I mean, it is, I mean, losing the secret identity is a huge loss. Um, but we did gain a couple of things. So I just wanted, to, I wanted to talk about it before we pulled the trigger. I was also leaning towards doing it, but I wanted to talk about it. I thought maybe we should have waited just a little bit longer, but I don't think I even vocalized that ever until just now and fast. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I would have liked to have told a couple of stories where we did get to see how things changed um, before, before we turned it around. But 1050 is a landmark issue. It's a good, it's a good time to do it. And I do like how we did it. I mean, it was, it was cool to, uh, to use Manchester Black in that way. Cause we had, a, it fit, it fit a couple of things that Manchester had been involved. We already established that Manchester Black was a traitor in some way. We didn't know how yet. Um, you know, Manchester Black's powers fit into, you know, what it was, you know, having him make that sacrifice or sacrificing him, I should say, after he actually made, did the turn and became a true believer in Superman and then losing him that way was powerful. Having Lex be the one who still knows and controls who gets to know that really makes him like a formidable villain. So there's, there's a lot of cool things that came out of that. Yeah. That's like I said, that's the aspect in particular that, uh, that, that I was, I was particularly excited by and I've very much enjoyed how that's been playing out particularly in, uh, in the Superman title. So again, I know you're on dad duty. I'm going to cut you loose, but I do want to give you the opportunity of course, to share with folks what you're currently working on. I know Hulk and and Green Lantern uh, war journal and actually on the note of Green Lantern, because I know you've tweeted a bit about this threads from your Superman run that will kind of start to pay off a little bit more in Green Lantern, fair to say? Yeah, you're going to see some you're going to see some stuff from Warworld Saga and Green Lantern going forward. So, catch up if you're not catch up, caught up now. I'm I'm really proud of that book. It's a it's a very different kind of character than than Superman. Like Superman and, and John Stewart are not the same and it's really fun uh just kind of showing what John cares about, who he is, how he's how he does the superhero thing differently and uh how his how his villains are different. I don't know. I really love writing John Stewart. So, Catch up with that book, Green Lantern War Journal, number five just hit. Um, and number six is the end of the first arc. That's a big one. Lots of action in number six, and then there's another arc coming up. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, so Incredible Hulk is also coming out monthly. I'm very proud of that book. Aside from that, there's not much I can talk about. I am doing a creator own that's coming out soon that I'm very excited about. And there are a couple other books at the big two that are coming out later this year as well. So stay tuned for for more superhero goodness. All right. Excellent. Well, I look forward to all of that and I encourage our audience to check it out as well. And Philip, thank you so much for coming on here and being a part of this. I really appreciate it. It was great speaking with you. It's my honor. Thanks for bringing me on. Of course. And thank you for your work on our favorite character. I've really enjoyed it a lot and I look forward to what might come next. (laughs) It really is the honor of a lifetime and uh, you'll see me writing Superman again. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, Philip. Thank you, audience. As always, make sure you come back next week for another all new episode. And until then, It's about what you do. It's about action. Be sure to check out our sister podcast series, another exciting episode in the adventures of Superman, an episode by episode breakdown of the classic George Reeves television show available wherever you get podcasts. Please join us on social media, become a patron and subscribe, rate and review today. Links are in the show notes. Thank you all.